Hello, and welcome to Gapna Chat, an official podcast of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. Gapna Chat provides interviews and discussions with Gapna leaders and members of the gerontological healthcare community, and will focus on advocacy, policy, education, professional development, research, and clinical care for older adults. In this episode, Dr. Cassandra Von Ness, a gerontological nurse practitioner and member of the GAPNA communication team, talks with Dr. Nanette Lavoie Vaughn, a nationally recognized leader in gerontological nursing and a member of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. In addition to her inspiration to become a gerontological nurse, Dr. Lavoie Vaughn discusses Diogenes syndrome and its pathophysiology in the older adult population, the psychological effects and behavior challenges experienced by individuals with Diogenes syndrome, and treatments for Diogenes syndrome APRNs should integrate into their practice. We are pleased to present Dr. Vanessa's interview with Dr. Lavoie Vaughn. Hello, everyone. Today we have with us on our GAPNA chat, Dr. Lynette Lavoie Vaughn. She is a currently practicing clinician at Transitions Medical Partners that provides geriatric house calls in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has over 30 years of experience in the geriatric field. Her educational accomplishments include an MSN from Florida State University and a DNP from Vanderbilt. She had completed a postdoctoral fellowship in ethnogeriatrics at Stanford University. She is the author of Elder Care, The Comprehensive Guide to Caregiving, and a new evidence-based clinical practice guideline for the non-pharmacologic management of behavioral problems in dementia. Her expertise in research is recognized through published work in clinics of North America and in book chapters and online continuing education modules. Welcome, Dr. Lavoie Vaughn, and thank you for being with us today to talk about Diogenes. Did I say it correctly? Diogenes, yeah. Diogenes <laughs> syndrome. Firstly, Dr. Lavoie Vaughn, with over 30 years of gerontological nursing experience, what would you say to the 18 year old Nanette about her future path? Well, I would say it's certainly going to turn out different than you thought when you were 18. I actually started in pediatrics in a hospital setting at a local hospital and then a large teaching hospital and as a school nurse and quickly became burnt out (laughs) and was very fortunate to get a position in a long-term care facility as an in-service director And that launched my career in geriatrics. And I've never looked back since. Um, Just 180 degrees from from pediatrics to Mm -hmm. fell in love with our population. Very much so. Yes, it it has definitely been a 30-year love affair with geriatrics. During the 2021 GAPNA National Conference in San Diego, some of us were fortunate to have heard your presentation on a complex case of Diogenes syndrome. Could you tell us a little bit about the definition, where the term came from, and presentation, please? Certainly. For those who aren't familiar with Diogenes, and hence the namesake for this very complex problem, Diogenes was a Greek philosopher in the fourth century BC, and he was kind of a rebel. He didn't believe in government oversight. He did not believe in people controlling what other people did. So he was very much his own man. Uh, He was known for living in a dirt pile or walking around in a barrel, philosophizing at street corners and trying to make changes. So definitely kind of the bad boy Renaissance man versus the um, (laughs) creative (laughs) Renaissance man. So when we look at the DSM-5 criteria for Diogenes syndrome, and it is part of the DSM-5 now because prior to this time, we recognized bits and pieces. And a lot of times people were misdiagnosed as having one component of this complex disorder. 
but basically it's a combination of either a psychiatric or a personality disorder that's also accompanied by hoarding and then also has some very specific skin conditions, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that are related to the poor hygiene that goes along with the whole complex of symptoms. So basically you have a person that may already have something like an underlying schizophrenia or an obsessive compulsive disorder or a history of psychosis or maybe alcohol use and has some degree of paranoia or suspiciousness. And then that starts to combine with a hoarding disorder and the other parts and pieces that go along with that, such as the self-isolation. It's almost like a nesting. They don't leave their home. They become totally encapsulated in their home and with all of their belongings and try and keep everybody away from them. So in relation to this presentation, you talked about some previous or related psychological disorders, but does a previous history of a psychological illness, such as I know uh, originally it fell under obsessive compulsive Mm -hmm. disorder, or is it related to a cognitive impairment? Actually, they're showing now that it can be either. And that's the interesting thing. Certainly the OCD was the first hook because it kind of made sense for some of the the behaviors, especially the hoarding. But now there's some literature out there and some evidence-based studies that have been done that are actually attaching this to frontal temporal dementia, that specific type of dementia, because they're also trying to look at the pathophysiology of what is the brain of a person with Diogenes syndrome. And so in doing some of that work, they have found that people with frontal temporal dementia, because of the changes in neurocircuitry there, that that might be some of the precipitating factors to develop a hoarding behavior and then the full-blown Diogenes syndrome. So yes, we are looking at some of the dementias as well. So you talked about hoarding behavior being included in this. With the prolonged difficulty of discarding unneeded possessions, and it could affect nearly 3% -hmm. of our population. For some of this, our experience is, you know, basically just limited to the reality show presentation of a hoarder. How do you conceptualize this hoarding behavior in a Diogenes syndrome in particular? Well, in particular, first of all, and I think to the DSM-5 now that's been developed for Diogenes has really helped that. So what they're saying is if you just look at the hoarding behavior by itself, it means that people have an excessive abnormal amount of things in their home and things can be anything. It can be garbage. It can be actual possessions. It can be pets. It can be animals that aren't pets. Anything can constitute the excessive abnormal collections. The clutter usually has no sentimental value to it. It's just that they have to have these things and they have- Oh, that's a a relief. So I don't have to worry about my tchotchkes of uh, flamingos or anything. Oh, no. Okay, good. Not at all. No. (laughs) (laughs) So no sentimental value. The attachment causes difficulty, though, because they have very poor insight. And I think that's one of the bigger clues is that the poor insight goes along with it, that they don't understand that this is going to become harmful and that this is not considered, unfortunately, what we would think would be a normal behavior. So it's very difficult for them to discard things. And then they combine that with being socially withdrawn they usually also have a shameless attitude. It's like, I don't care what people think. This is the way I like to live. And this is the way I live. And I kind of am suspicious of other people anyway. And I don't necessarily trust society and, and my place in it. So also too, there's some degree of social anxiety. These may have been people too, that kind of had a, a, a reticent personality to begin with, that they don't have a support system that they weren't really close to family members or they don't have a large group of friends or even one friend that they can rely on. So they're, they're kind of the loners already or they have pulled themselves away from their family 
and those relationships and are just much more comfortable being in their own little setting with all of their stuff. Are there signs that we may see, you know, as providers, is this something that may develop over the course of several years or is it one precipitating event like, you know, maybe the retirement or loss of a spouse, something that would, you know, push the patient, you know, to the extreme? That is still being studied too, because we're finding some people that this is just kind of a lifelong adult thing for them, but there's others that are going along pretty fine. And then something pushes them over the edge. And that may be the death of a spouse, or it may be a family disagreement and separation from family, or it may be an illness or the development of a cognitive impairment or the worsening of an underlying psychiatric condition that wasn't treated. Because unfortunately, too, we're finding now that another caveat with this group of folks is that they have a distrust of the medical profession. So they may not have been seeking any type of medical care or psychiatric care. And there may be a lot of undiagnosed issues that are going on. And some of those may have been the tipping point. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Now, you you highlighted one complex, I mean, very complex case. And during our GAPNA conference, could you share a little bit and talk us through that case presentation? And we can see some of these elements you know, in clinical practice? Mm -hmm. Yes. And this was very typical that this gentleman did not have a diagnosis already. He was admitted to a skilled nursing facility for short-term rehabilitation. And at that time I was working with a Jerry psychiatric practice. We were doing a consultation for patients with depression, anxiety, dementia behaviors. And so I was asked to see him for depression. He had been in several days already. I quickly reviewed his medical records in the hospital. And of note, he had called 911 saying that he was not able to get out of his recliner chair. And so 911 responded. And there was a little notation in the chart that they had had to peel him out of his recliner chair. And I was thinking, hmm, all right, that's kind of interesting. But, you know, I've seen a lot of people in their home settings who live in their recliner chairs. And it may be, you know, if he was particularly ill and not able to stand up, they had to peel him out of the chair. So didn't really think anything about that. I noticed, too, that he had been given a diagnosis of significant cellulitis in both of his legs. And that was part of the rehab was that those areas were going to need to be treated and he was going to need some help with ambulation and things. So I figured, okay, well, you know, pretty typical visit. So when I went in to see him for the first time, he had very unkempt hair. He had a very long beard. He had a lot of dry, flaky skin everywhere. His legs were wrapped um, with the therapeutic dressings that they were using. He didn't make good eye contact. He kind of gave me monosyllabic answers. And his biggest concern was he needed to get back home because he had a cat. And he was very worried about his cat. So we talked a little and I explained why I was there and, you know, shared my concern and said that, you know, I'd be contacting his family and we could see, I'm sure one of them had gone to get the cat and we would take care of things. So I did receive a message that his oldest brother, he was one of five siblings, had wanted to speak to me after the visit. So I called the brother and that's really when the pictures started to open up because the brother told me that they had always been worried about him. Being the youngest sibling, he had always been kind of babied by their parents and by the whole family because he had been what he considered an odd child growing up. He just didn't seem to fit in anywhere. He didn't have a lot of friends. After high school, when they tried to get him a job, whatever job they got him, he wouldn't keep because he would go loaf off and play golf instead of delivering the packages he was supposed to deliver. And so he was constantly losing jobs. So finally, the family just said, oh, forget it. Come live with mom and dad. Well, mom and dad passed away. And so he was living in their home alone. And the brother said over the last year or so, he had started to notice that when they went to try and visit him, he didn't want them to come in the house. He'd say, just leave this stuff on the porch. I don't want to see anybody right now. So they were thinking, well, that's kind of weird, but they didn't really push it because they knew he was kind of the odd person in the family anyway. When they got the call from EMS, of course, 
after they saw him at the hospital and saw what condition he was in, they went over to the house and he told me that literally when they walked in, they just started crying because the house literally was ceiling to floor, every room loaded with trash and belongings and just all kinds of things. And that the cat that was living in the house was a feral cat. The kitchen was unusable. So there were stacks of takeout containers and pizza boxes and everything everywhere. And that the recliner chair was totally encrusted with who knows what. And there were streaks of blood on the floor where he'd been attempting to walk to the front door to pick things up when they left them, obviously, or if he had food delivered. And he said, so we're very concerned that there's something else going on here. So, of course, when I saw and heard that picture, I'm like, okay, we definitely have something different going on here. So went, did my research and started putting in things about hoarding and about personalities. And lo and behold, up popped the DSM-5 for Diogenes syndrome. And so I said, I think this is what we've got. And he certainly fit all of the boxes because the, the skin condition that he had is something that comes along specifically with Diogenes syndrome. It's called dermatitis passivata. And it's these horny crusts of dry flaking skin, because a lot of times also there's very poor hygiene in these folks. They basically exist in a recliner chair or on a mattress surrounded by all their stuff and they don't bathe because a lot of times the hoarding is such they can't even get into a sink in the bathroom or the kitchen. So we don't know when the last time he had bathed was and they literally had to put him in a soaking tub to start to get all of these lesions off of his skin. How did you begin as a clinician to, you know, clearly the connection you need to make and Mm -hmm. communicate, but, you know, do you begin with pharmacologic intervention and use those together? How did you, you know, even begin to take care of this gentleman? Exactly. Because first of all, he was resistant to, you know, even any kind of treatment, taking a bath. He was eating very well, (laughs) but he didn't want the staff to help him bathe. He didn't want to bathe. He just wanted to go home. So I knew it was going to probably take a village, first of all, and knew he was going to have to learn to trust me before he would even consider taking medication. So the first thing we did, and I was very fortunate that this was a facility that was very compassionate towards this whole situation. So we decided to take a whole team approach. And we set up a meeting so that we had the administrator, we had the director of nursing, we had the nurse and the nursing assistant who were assigned to this gentleman, his brother, the oldest brother who he trusted the most, and himself. And we all sat down together and kind of talked about, you know, his brother's concerns about how they wanted to help him and and realized that maybe he had just gotten in over his head with things because their parents were gone and that his whole family loved him and wanted to be there for him and help him. So they were going to go and clean up the house so he could eventually come back home. And one of the brothers took his cat so he would feel comfortable that somebody had the cat. And then we talked about that this was going to be something he needed help with for a while. And so he needed to stay with us to get his legs treated, which he was okay with because he knew he wouldn't be able to walk unless the legs were treated. And then after that meeting, then he started to feel a little bit more comfortable. So then it was kind of a day by day sort of thing is starting to build the trust. So instead of, you know, we're with my other patients, I may have only seen them every week when I was there. I was doing some telehealth in between so that we could continue to have that relationship. And he wasn't sleeping well because he was in a different environment and worrying about the cat. (laughs) So I was kind of able to introduce the fact that, well, let's maybe start something to help you sleep a little bit. And so he was kind of open to that. So I was able to give him some melatonin and we started that way. And then when he realized that he was starting to feel a little bit better and we had some other plans because then it was like we had to re-meet because we're like, you know, it's going to take a long time for this house to get ready again. 
and you don't want to live with anyone else, but we're going to have to have some kind of situation to help you out with that. So the family was very involved and they were able to find a small group home with four other gentlemen where he'd have his own room and it was near the rest of his family. And it was also near the family home so that he could go by with them to see the progress and how things were building. So that was kind of our long range plan. And then once he got very comfortable with me, I said to him, okay, now, obviously, this whole situation has been very depressing for you to be here, to have to have all these discussions. And so as I do with a lot of my patients who are reluctant to take an antidepressant, I kind of talk about how sometimes we have no control over that, that it's the chemicals in our brain that are causing the way we feel and the causing the way we act. And so we have medication that can help that and that that is something he was going to need to help him through this long range situation. And in the very little evidence-based research we have out there, we do know that paroxetine or Paxil does work for hoarding in some cases. And we're also finding that high dose sertraline has been effective for the whole kind of psychological and psychiatric portion of Diogenes. So the family was concerned about a doubling up medication. And so we decided instead that our best bet would be to start some high dose Zoloft, the sertraline. And so because I had built enough of a trust with him at that point, he was comfortable with starting it because I also told him too, that that would improve his mood just in general and help him to cope with what was coming up. So we started at 50, and by the time he was discharged to the group home, I had him up on 100. I mean, of course, at that point, I lost track of him, but he was at least making good progress when he left, that he was not having any angry outbursts. He was feeling a little bit more comfortable about what his plan was. And I only hope that, you know, he was able to follow through with someone in the community. How fortunate, though, to have that you know, support system, the family that was supportive, you know, I can certainly imagine scenarios that would Mm -hmm. be very different. And, um, yes, (laughs) you know, if he did not, this is always, you know, a hard, a hard issue to discuss when a patient that during an acute care stay, maybe you or the social worker has identified that they're at risk to themselves and cannot return to an independent type, you know, lifestyle. You know, have you had any situations like that, you know, care related, you know, without a particular cognitive event or something else that's precipitated it where where you had to intervene for safety? Yeah, that's unfortunately quite common. A lot of the patients I work with live in rural areas and don't have family or don't have any close network. And then it really becomes a challenge because it's like, okay, and then are they, you know, so then we have to determine, are they competent to make their own decisions? So it may involve a competency evaluation from a psychiatrist. It may mean having to get a state appointed guardian, you know, if they're not competent. And then sometimes if they're coming out of acute care, we've at least got some time to have them in a a skilled nursing facility for rehab or for continued medical monitoring while we can work on all of these issues. But a lot of times then what I find is that there really is no other place for them to go and they land up being declared incompetent with a state appointed guardian and land up living the rest of their life in a skilled nursing facility. I'm going to ask you a final question and I'm going to tap into your ethnogeriatrics, but yes. also your, your doctoral work. So okay. I'll get two, two for one for our audience. Why not? Um, so you developed some non-pharmacologic mm-hmm. guidelines for yes. be- these behavior challenges that we have with patients that suffer from mm-hmm. dementia. What are some cultural components that mm-hmm. APRNs you know, should integrate and should understand in their practice? Well, there are different cultures look at dementia and look at psychiatric illnesses very differently than traditionally what we do here in the United States. 
and we're becoming a much more diverse population. No matter where you live now, it's a very diverse population. And so it's really important for people in this profession, if you've not had access to information on ethnogeriatrics, to really kind of get a good baseline, because especially in many different cultural groups, dementia is looked upon as a stigma or something that's related to something that they've done in their past that they're being punished for. In some other cases, there's a very strong tie to their religious beliefs. They use a lot of natural home remedies sometimes to deal with the symptoms. And then also, too, there's the whole family dynamics. Because, you know, when we're giving these diagnoses, they're they're very devastating, first of all, whether it's dementia or a psychiatric disorder. And so discussing with families the diagnosis in itself or the management of the diagnosis, understanding how the hierarchy in that family works because in some cultures, it's very male-driven, that it may be the oldest son, or it may be the husband. I have a situation right now with a family that I'm working with where the oldest son is in the medical field, as well as being the spokesperson for the family. And so the wife and the daughter are on board with me, but then when they call their brother or son and say, hey, Nan has said this, and this is what she wants to do for dad. He's like, oh, no, we need to think about this and this and this and this and this and this and this. So it's that juggling, you know, of how we can That can make patient-centered care very difficult. Very much so. (laughs) So the great thing is that Stanford, where I got my postdoctorate, and unfortunately, they don't do that program anymore because several of the people who were involved with that retired but they have left all of their materials on their website. So if you do go to the Stanford University website and just type in ethnogeriatrics, they have all kinds of resources there. They haven't been updated in a while, but the basic information is still very good. They have some PowerPoints and reference lists because obviously they kind of became the 800 pound gorilla because being in California, that's always been a diverse population. And they realized that people around the country needed to have this information. And that's I'm becoming seeing, a very basic competency now. It in, is. Um, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of the conferences, a lot of the CMEs that are coming up for different areas in medical care are including ethnogeriatrics as one of the topics. Well, I want to thank you so much today, Dr. Lavoie Vaughn, for joining us and sharing your time and expertise for us. Do you have any parting words that you would like to share with our listening audience? Well, as always, uh, you know, GAPNA has been such a phenomenal, (laughs) phenomenal group for those of us in geriatrics. And just as a little side plug, I am completing right now a white paper on neurobiological behavior management for GAPNA, working with Rosemary Mannion. So we have that in process and we're going to be doing a webinar hopefully this fall based on the paper. So people can look for that. And I will be attending GAPNA this year in Orlando. So look forward to seeing my colleagues there. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Cassandra Von Ness for GAPNA Chat, thanking all of you for being part of the conversation. Until next time, be kind to yourself and one another. GAPNA Chat is owned and produced by the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association, all rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. With over 30 years of experience in the geriatric healthcare field, Dr. Nanette Lavoie Vaughn is currently a clinician at Transitions Medical Partners, providing house calls to older adults in Raleigh, North Carolina. She is a clinical assistant professor at East Carolina University College of Nursing, a clinical instructor at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and an adjunct faculty member at Vanderbilt University School of Nursing. She is the author of Elder Care, The Comprehensive Guide to Caregiving, and a new evidence-based clinical practice guideline for the non-pharmacological management of behavioral problems in dementia. Dr. Cassandra Vaughness is the Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders, 
McNeish, Coordinator, Geriatric Oncology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. She is a member of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association Communication Team and is a host of the Gapna Chat podcast series. For archived episodes of Gapna Chat and to learn more about the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association, visit gapna.org. You can also subscribe to Gapna Chat everywhere podcasts are found.